Hello everybody, my name is that Joe Guy and welcome to Dragon Age Keep. Alright, so I'm preparing my body and mind for Dragon Age Inquisition and apparently instead of importing your saves from Origins or 2 directly into the game, you need to go through this admittedly wonderfully drawn and detailed world state creation thing instead. Probably because the world state coding was all confused at the end of Origins and the repeated environments in 2 mean even the game can't tell one quest from another, but hey, I'm game. There's even a cool wee video you can watch for a recap when you're done. If you believe the stories, mankind's pride gave rise to the dark spawn. Yeah, sorry Varric, your voice is like marshmallow, but you're going too slow and there's a lot to get through. So whether you've watched my Origins and DOS series before this, or if you're a brand new shiny viewer, let's take this opportunity to recap. My hero in Origins was Nathan Kuzland, youngest son of future dead person Tern Bryce of High Ever and Archer Extraordinaire. His happy carefree life was interrupted when his family was betrayed by national treasure team Curry and Nathan was forced to flee his dying parents with an all round badass and beard specialist called Duncan. The price of his rescue? Nathan would be inducted into Duncan's Order, the Grey Wardens, a role in which Nathan was originally uninterested but which he learned to embrace like a set of dying parents. The Grey Wardens were a faction whose job it was to fight evil monsters called Darkspawn whilst the rest of the kingdom danced about ignoring the problem even as it was barfing black bile all over the suburbs. A task made all the more important when Tern Watt Monsters Logan betrayed the King and the Wardens during the battle. Without the assistance of the legendary Witch of the Wilds Flemeth, this story wouldn't have even made a passive second betrayal. The only survivors of the battle were Nathan, his dog Glenald, and another junior warden called Alistair. And what with Alistair having all the leadership skills of a used tea bag, Nathan decided to lead the charge against the Darkspawn himself. With a hoot and a holler, Nathan kidnapped Flemish's daughter Morgan and set out to round up an army to put both Evil Monster Army and their Dragon King the Archdemon to the sword. On his way out of town, he also kidnapped future girlfriend Liliana and future pain in the ass Sten, who he thought were both just crazy enough to come in useful. Where are we going to get an army? Nathan asked. Turns out I'm the prince, said Alistair, and off they popped to tell the king's uncle Arleman in Redcliffe that Logan, currently sitting on the throne being all complex and determined about shit was mean and that they needed an army more than he did. Unfortunately, when they arrived at Redcliffe, they discovered that they were all busy filming the Evil Dead 3 and couldn't help out because the extras had unionised. After a few ill-fated encounters with the game's learning curve, Nathan and crew defended the town, fought their way to the castle and discovered a sick Arl, a sad Arlesa and their son, who made a deal with a demon who promised to keep his dad on life support in exchange for letting her possess him. A quick consultation with a useful assassin nearby and off they went to the Mage's Circle to ask about the cure for possession, and also to ask them to help fight monsters with them while they were at it. Turns out the circle had their own problems, as all the mages volunteer security had also unionised on account of their bosses maybe being possessed by the demons who had overrun the tower. Erring on the side of not evil, Nathan decided to spare all the maybe possessed mages, kidnapped a wise old lady called Wynn and made his way through the tower killing every demon he found. After ascending to the top and killing the pride demon who was busy doing the whole army of darkness thing, Nathan rescued Dumbledore and the tower was saved without the genocide of the magically able. The mages in return agreed to all go get killed by Darkspawn together and return with Nathan and crew to Redcliffe to cure the Arl's son. A quick jaunt up a mountain to the chemists later, skipping over the uncovering and slaying of a cult who worshipped a dragon who they believe was actually the most holy prophet of the Chantry reincarnated and then slaying said dragon and passing the holy trial in order to obtain a pinch of holy ashes from the same not dragon prophet and Arl Lehman was also back on his feet. Whilst he got his bruiser buddies together to give old Logan what for, Nathan and crew went to speak with the elves to see if they wouldn't mind forgiving humans for generations of genocide and oppression just long enough to save the land from monsters. Side note, turns out Flemeth, the witch from earlier, was actually evil so Nathan went back to kill her, steal her book and return it to Morrigan who shortly afterwards became all mysterious and cryptic. More on that later. Other side note, on the way Nathan kidnapped an assassin, called him Zevran, cause that's his name, and promised to be flirty friends with him as long as they both stopped trying to kill each other. Hey look, the elves are busy too on account of being attacked by werewolves. Turns out the werewolves were actually humans, a bit obvious given the etymology of the name, cursed by boss elf and professional Salk Zathrian. Thankfully, a frank exchange of violence and righteous indignation later convinced Zathrian to lift the curse and the werewolves turned back to human in one of the most frankly air punch worthy moments of the whole game. With elves no longer turning Fido and having made strong ties with Nathan by this point, the pointy-eared nomads decided to join the anti-Darkspawn movement. Whilst passing by a nearby mountain on the way back, Nathan decided to pop in to see if the dwarves wanted to help too. 37 episodes of political bullshit later, he emerged with a drunk dwarf friend called Ogryn in the support of the new dwarven king Balin, a corrupt but progressive asshole whose first degree in office was to lop the head of his political rival. Nathan also destroyed an ancient anvil which could magically take the souls of dwarves and turn them into badass robots. Apparently nobody thought that that would be useful in an epic battle scenario. So with the support of the tall, short and slim, Nathan proceeded to the capital city of Denarim to discuss why the nobles should stop fighting each other and focus on the blight, and also to confront the traitor Logan about why he had been being so difficult for a year. Aside from dropping by for a bit of vengeance on the man who killed his family and subsequent brief incarceration, the landsmate proceeded smoothly. Mr. Logan lost the support of the nobles and his fate fell into Nathan's hands. 
Logan in the end proved to be good hearted but stubborn and misguided and between this and his previous betrayal neither Nathan nor Alistair are willing to grant him mercy by accepting him into the Grey Wardens. In a sad moment Nathan executed him. Nathan shortly afterwards endorsed Logan's smart and competent daughter Enora as queen, which may have karmically made up for just killing her father if it wasn't for the fact that Nathan also insisted she marry his buddy Alistair. Enora had the brains, Alistair had the heart, and together they made for a powerful political couple, but I doubt there was much in the way of pillow talk between them. With this final obstacle out of the way, the time had come to march on the Darkspawn. You could tell were assholes because of the way they waited until the army had marched all the way to Redcliffe before deciding to attack the place they'd just come from. With monsters sacking Denrim, the army needed to get back as soon as possible and would march at dawn's first light. That night though, the revelation came that whichever warden killed the Archdemon would die. Morrigan, however, had a solution to this. Nathan, a Grey Warden by blood, could impregnate her, and the Archdemon's taint would then transfer to the child on the dragon's death. The child would survive, the Warden would survive, and no one need die. Despite being in love with Liliana, Nathan valued his and his comrade's life enough to complete the ritual with Morrigan. The Battle of Denrim came, the armies fought, and the Archdemon was slain. Nathan Kuzland of the Grey Warden survived to see another day. The Blight was defeated, but the Darkspawn were still partying around the countryside, generating noise complaints and strange reports that some of them could talk. Meanwhile, someone thought that it was a good idea to let Nathan run a country, so quickly he enlisted the help of a racist elf, a drunk dwarf, a cool dwarf, a moodier version of himself, the embodied concept of justice headlining as the amazing decomposing face, and Mage Alistair. Despite a seething hatred of politics and at least one accidental famine, he managed to defend both his keep and the town of Amaranthine from the Horde, whilst at the same time overcoming his racism to make his first Darkspawn friend the Architect, a bony wizard who looked like a science teacher if you melted him a bit, and who may have been responsible for all the monsters she killed in the first game, but hey, it's a dark spawn, what are you gonna do? Together, Nathan and building designer managed to kill the pale hentai fan in charge of the dark spawn army and save the land once again. Nathan then decided to take a holiday to try and find his arch demon baby, who he thinks he last saw in Morgan's womb. With the help of dog, elf, and nerd, they discovered that Morgan was researching the Alluvian, tall mysterious mirrors which apparently double as both cell phones and dangerous portals. Not quite friends, but far from enemies, Nathan and Morrigan said their goodbyes and Morrigan entered the mirror to tend to the child that Nathan would never meet. With that, we also said goodbye to our Grey Warden. Let's jump back a few years to when Nathan was first kidnapping a witch's daughter. Around this time, the strong strapping warrior and alopecia enthusiast Ian Hawk was fleeing from the darkspawn with what was left of his family. Who knew that from these humble beginnings, this jocular young Baldwin would later become the honoured champion of a complete shithole? The man standing in the tornado of Kunari Uprising, Chantry Destruction and Mage Rebellion. Let's meet the Hawks. Here is Ian's beloved mother, kind soul with a love of life and family. And Bethany, talented mage apostate who Ian would defend from Templar scrutiny with his life, and Deer Carver, whose strong sword swings could topple even- oh crap he died, and so did this woman's husband. Oh look it's Flemeth, the old witch from the first game, who may also be a dragon or a demon or a demigod or basically anything scarier than doddering old lady and who also at this point still hadn't been killed by the game's first protagonist. So in exchange for accidentally resurrecting her later, she agrees to fly everyone to Kirkwall, a lovely city aside from the fact that it's in the grip of either incompetent or oppressive leadership depending on whose office was open that day. Also nobody had thought yet to remove the spikes or angry statues from when the whole city was used to intimidate slaves a few centuries ago. I guess they were too busy keeping all the mages in prison in a place literally called the Gallows. With nothing to their name, both Ian and Bethany were forced to earn their way into the city, working for a mercenary company called May Vultures Sit You Into the Ocean Incorporated. One year later, the Hawks were still in poverty and the mage-hungry Templars were breathing down their necks. Luckily, a spot was open on a treasure hunting expedition into the old Dwarven Deep Roads for the reasonable price of more money than you have ever had. With the encouragement of new friend and beardless Dwarf Varric, whose brother was running the venture, the Hawks started to put aside a bit of coin here and there for this investment, and this prudent fiscal behaviour managed to attract the attention of several other new friends, such as a broody neon elf called Fenris, a pretty church boy with more heart than brains called Sebastian, a sexy pirate sexy captain called Isabella, and an endearingly clueless elf called Meryl, who was completely adorable aside from the whole blood magic consorting with demons thing. Oh, and remember Justice and Anders from the last game? Well, they're married now and are both living in the uncomfortably tight quarters of Anders' head. Anyway, between dealing with Templar mage nonsense and unsuccessfully trying to learn how the Kunari think, Ian did eventually manage to raise enough gold to sponsor the expedition, but on the way out of town, Ian's mother approached, begging Ian and not to take Bethany with him, not to leave her alone in the city. Bethany insisted she wanted to go though, and Ian, respecting her choice, brought her. In the darkness of the deep roads, Bethany succumbed to the darkspawn taint, 
and died in Ian's arms. Despite being betrayed and left for dead by Varric's brother, Ian and Cole managed to emerge from the caverns with one less family member but with enough riches to drag him and his mother out of the gutter and into the noble courts of Hightown. Ian had also made a bit of a name for himself after shaking down the city for coin, so much so that three years later he was called into the Viscount's office and asked to go sort out the Kunari problem. The Kunari were a race of folk who had been living in Kirkwall for the past few years, nobody really knew why and everyone was too afraid to ask on account of them all being seven foot tall grey horn murderous behemoths. Anyway, as Ian set to work trying to piss off as little people as possible, his relationship with his friends developed, particularly with Meryl. However, Ian was still always wary of her dalliance with demons. She claimed they would help her revive the elven civilization, but Ian maintained that demons were scary. Still, by this point, Ian had begun to hold people's freedom to choose above everything else and respected Meryl's wishes, supporting her how he could. A few quests and conspiracies later, the Kunari still had not found what they were looking for, which turned out to be a particularly shiny book which Isabella had stolen and subsequently lost some years ago. She confessed this after asking for Hawk's help tracking it down, but Ian refused to let her keep it and Isabella fled with the book in Kirkwall's last hope to avoid a bloodbath. The book gone and the Kunari shaking their heads disapprovingly on everything that Kirkwall represented, they finally snapped, attacking the city and killing the Viscount. Hawk wound up facing the Arashok and his retinue in a fight to the death and with the help of Anders, Varric and Aveline, that magnificent ginger bulwark of a woman, Hawk narrowly triumphed and earned the title Champion of Kirkwall. Another three years later, the Templar Knight Commander, and definitely not mad with power, Meredith, has stepped in and is running Kirkwall with an iron fist placed directly in the ass of the mages. See, over the last few years, the mage situation in Kirkwall has become somewhat silly. Mages, tired of being oppressed by their Templar watchers, flee supervision, and a few, alright, more than a few, resort to blood magic and demonic possession to escape. Meanwhile, the Templars, all too aware of the damage the number a mage can do, grip tighter and tighter, making the lives of even mages who cooperate miserable. None of these perspectives were without reason, of course. In fact, a loose mage conducting sick necromantic experiments led to Ian's mother's gruesome and tragic death in Act 2. But despite this, Ian's thoughts fell on the side of the mages. Everybody dies anyway, and freedom is unfortunately more vital to protect than lives. By the way, a quick update on Ian's friends' MySpace statuses. I'm Fenris and I hate mages, but I didn't kill my sister, so that's something. I'm Aveline and despite a disastrously coy courtship period, I'm now married again. Hooray! I'm Varric and my turncoat brother turns out to have been turned mad by a strange red lyrium artifact we found in the Deep Roads. In fact, it very nearly drove me mad as well, but now we're both frying aside from my brother still being insane. I'm Sebastian and honestly, I'm not really worth mentioning. I'm Meryl and it turns out the demon I was consorting with didn't want to help me, so my mentor let herself get possessed and I had to kill her. On the bright side, though, I didn't have to kill my whole clan when they found out. But they did exile me a bit and now everything I was working towards for the last seven years has come to nothing. And lastly, I'm Anders, and the spirit of justice inside my head may or may not be driving me insane, but don't worry about it. Anyway, the mages and Templars. As anyone experienced with handling sand relationships or used needles can attest, the tighter you hold something, the more it slips through your fingers and sticks into your arm right before an important meeting, and eventually this powder cake of a situation was ignited by none other than dear Anders, who magi-bombed the Chantry, killing many, including the conflict's only chance for compromise. Meredith naturally blamed all mages, despite the actual murder being right in front of her, and ordered her Templars to kill every mage in the city. The mages in turn decided that they didn't much like the sound of that and fought back. Meanwhile, Anders' fate fell to Ian, who though being tempted by both vengeance and exile, decided to spare him. You can't atone for a crime without being there to clean up your own mess, after all. After a pitch battle including many deaths on both sides, including Fenris's death at the hands of Ian, Hawk confronted Meredith in the Gallows Square. Meredith revealed herself to have acquired the same dangerous red lyrium artifact from before and it had long since driven her mad and paranoid. Admittedly, this did explain a lot, but it didn't change the fact that Meredith needed to die for the conflict to stop. Ian and Meredith fought, and the Knight Commander was killed, turned to a lyrium statue by the unstable power she wielded. Ian and his crew, victorious but still unwelcome in the City of Templars, left Kirkwall for good after to this. Meryl, Anders, Aveline and Varric went with him, but aside from Meryl all eventually left his sight and the champion himself disappeared. And that really is it. Of course I could never cover or comment on everything that's happened over these two magnificently long games, so if you want to see Nathan and Ian's full stories then you can find them tagged onto the end of this video. In the meantime, I'm gonna go get prepped for what comes next. Hope y'all are along for the ride because I'm sure that whatever it is is going to be spectacular. Thanks very much for watching everybody, and I will see you in the first episode of Dragon Age Inquisition.